is James Curry. Um, I've known James for over 15 years. We've worked on things like Dijon's conjecture and abelian uh, repetitions in words. Uh, James is actually, um, as of I guess the 1st of August, will be the acting president of the University of Winnipeg. Uh, but before he starts his new position, he's going to tell you about some of the research he's been doing lately. So he's going to talk about uh, remarks on Pansio encodings. Thanks, Narad. So um, I, I will mention some things I've been doing, but I also I like to pose problems and to point out areas that I think would be interesting to work on. And I recently noticed that, that several things which had crossed my scope involved Poncio encodings, and uh, that one might And there are some variations that are probably useful. So I'll first introduce uh, Poncio encodings in a concrete way, looking at how they relate to uh, ternary square free words. Then I'll talk a little bit about Dijon's conjecture. And uh, Pansio encodings, when you use them in the context of Dijon's conjecture, you're led to consider what are known as kernel repetitions. So I will talk about those a bit. And then I will talk about some graphs uh, which relate to Pansio encodings. And then, oh, sorry, my window just blew open, I think. My door just blew open. It's, it's fun to work at home. Uh, then I'm going to talk about circular words, uh, undirected powers, which is recent work with uh, Lucas Mall. And then I will talk about you want to work in a So here it goes. So I will be using a variety of alphabets. Uh, so sigma n, I will, I will start at zero as if I were a computer scientist. So sigma n is the letters from zero up to n minus one. But now let's go back to a classical setting and let's consider an infinite square free ternary word. So I have this word W, the AI are letters. And the Pansio encoding of W is a binary sequence, a pi for Pansio, and uh, B I is equal to zero, if AI is equal to AI plus one. James? Yes, sir. I only see your first slide currently. All right, that's interesting. I uh, will back up and... Oh, all right, let me... Uh... So is that better? Nope, still the same for me. But... Interesting, because it... All right, let's see. Bring your shared window to the front. Stop share, new share. Sorry, people. It's all very... Uh... There we oh, go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so... All right, so I have an... Uh, please, uh, please let me know as I continue to uh, fumble uh, technology. So here's a ternary uh, square-free word. And the Pansio encoding, the ith digit is zero if AI is equal to AI plus two, otherwise it's a one. Can you see a new slide? Yeah. Excellent. So uh, VTM. The people using for this variation of the 2A Morse word. Uh, is the fixed point of the morphism where zero goes to zero, one, two, one goes to zero, two, and two goes to one. So here's the Poncio encoder. You can see that uh, the, the zero is not the same as two, so that's encoded by a one. Then one is not the same as zero, so that's also encoded by a one. However, here I have a couple of twos. This is encoded by a zero. These digits differ, so there's a one. These digits differ, so there's the one. And here I go, putting in the Poncio encoding in red. And this also goes backwards. 
So a ternary square free word can be recovered from its poncio encoding and its first two letters. So here, if I have the poncio encoding above and I'm considering this letter, which corresponds to the blue digit of the poncio encoding, the one of the poncio encoding shows that this digit cannot be a zero. These two digits don't match. I automatically know in a square free word that it can't be a one since one one would be a square. So this has to be a two. If I look at the next digit, I have a one. So it cannot match this one. Uh, I can't have a two here because that would be a little square. So this must be a zero and so forth. So I don't have a two here. Oh, excuse me, I do have a two here. Since this is a zero, these must be the same. So you can take a ternary square free word and encode it using a binary square free word. All right, hopefully I have a new slide. I don't hear anyone demurring. So, and let me make sure I have my chat window available. All right, fading in and out a little, only seeing your first slide. Okay, sorry. All right, so a word of the form x, y, x, where x, y is non-empty, is a k power where k is the length of x, y, x divided by the length of x, y. An r plus power is a k power for some k greater than r. Now we define the repetitive threshold function r t of n, this is the supremum over r such that every infinite contains an r plus power. So this is, this is the, the largest unavoidable power over a word, or alternatively, it's the infimum of the avoidable powers. Now, a theorem, uh, Dijon's conjecture, was that the repetitive threshold function is given by r t of n is two when n equals two, it's seven quarters when n equals three, seven fifths when n equals four, and then it's n divided by n minus one for all n greater than or equal to five. So this was established via the work of many people, uh, particularly Carpi, who, who killed off all of the cases except for finitely many that were left over. So fix greater than or equal to two, and let u be a threshold word over the alphabet sigma n. So what I mean by that, so here's w, the a, i are letters. w contains no r plus powers where r is the repetitive threshold. So the situation that we saw with square free words generalizes. Suppose u a is a factor of w uh, where the length of u is n minus one and a is the letter. Uh, because u doesn't contain any r plus power, the letters of u have to be distinct. Uh, and further, either A is the first letter of U or it doesn't occur in U at all. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, sort of read up on Dijon's conjecture. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Then we have a poncio encoding, a binary encoding of the word, uh, where BI is zero if AI is equal to AI plus N minus one. Otherwise, it's one and word w can be recovered from its poncio encoding and its prefix of length n minus one. So poncio encodings allowed Dijon's conjecture to be resolved via constructions on binary alphabets uh, rather than by working on the big alphabets. And in published work on Dijon's conjecture, to recover information about uh, k powers in w, from the Poncio encoding, group theory is used. 
So long repeated factors in a word W correspond to long repeated factors in the Poncio encoder. So for example, here we have the factor 0, 1, 2, uh, 0, 2, 1, 0. It shows up twice in the word, and in the places where it shows up, because of the way Poncio encodings are defined, you have a repeated factor in the Poncio encoder. However, uh, this doesn't go backwards. If I look here, I have two repeated factors in the Poncio encoder. So I have 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And over here, I have 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. However, the, the corresponding words in VTM are different. I have 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 0. And I have 2, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 2. So the factor in W here is only repeated up to a permutation. I've switched the zero and the two. So consider the length n minus one factor u of threshold word w. So u looks like a zero, a one, up to a n minus two, where the a i are distinct letters of sigma n. So let me see, I've got, I've got these indices. I've, I've got n minus one different letters here. My alphabet has n letters. So there's a unique letter which is left over. Let a n minus one be the unique letter in sigma n uh, minus a zero a one up to a n minus one. So consider the correspondence which takes this factor of length n minus one and maps it to a permutation. So I take the letters of the word a0, a1, up to an minus one, and then the leftover letter is thrown in here at the end. So this uh, matches uh, factors of length n minus one with distinct letters and permutations. So, now, suppose I look at the length n minus one factor, which is at index i in the word w. And as before, I let bi be the ith letter of the Poncio encoding of w. Then the permutation that I get from the word at position i plus one can be found from the permutation I have um, given the word at position i um, in a way which uh, comes from the Poncio encoding. In fact, uh, phi of ui plus one is i times phi ui, where sigma zero is this permutation and sigma one is this permutation. Now, for me, it's a little bit hard to keep all of this in my head. So let me give you a concrete example of how this works. We will go back to the three letter alphabet and uh, VTM. So let me add these two words in VTM. Uh, so in the example where n is three, n minus one is two, and here I have the word at position zero, so u zero is zero one. And here, 0, 1, 2, 3, this is the word at index 3. So u3 is 0, 2. Uh, the Pancio encoding, we've already seen it. Uh, sigma 0, uh, going back to the definition on the previous page, is the permutation where 0 maps to 1, 1 maps to 0, 2 stays fixed. So I will just write that using a cycle notation. We're, we're, uh, it's the cycle uh, where zero goes to one. Uh, sigma one, according to the definition on the previous slide, is the permutation where zero goes to one, one goes to two, two goes to zero. So that's a cycle of length three. And sure enough, oh, sorry. Um, and this word zero one looks like this. I've got zero and one, and the letter which doesn't appear is two. 
and then the image of the word is zero two, phi of zero two, I've got zero and two. And then the uh, letter which doesn't appear in that is a one. So that is phi of zero is the identity, uh, phi of u three is this little two cycle. And so if I start with phi of zero, the Poncio encoding starts one, one, zero. So I take phi of u zero, I multiply it by sigma of one, then I multiply it by sigma of one, then I multiply it by sigma of zero. So what happens is uh, phi of u zero is the identity, then we have zero going to one going to two, and now so zero goes to one, which goes to two, which, let me see, which way do I want to multiply? Well, you can see during multiplication So, however, I, it does, does come out correctly, but when, you, when you're working on, you're reading through the work of Moulin Oladier, and uh, you're looking at this group theory, it's easy to get a little bit confused. So, I just want to point out that instead of trying to keep track of all these permutations and do multiplications in the group, oh, sorry, one, one more slide before I show how easy it all is. My, my pardon me. Um, so let sigma be the anti-morphism on uh, sigma two generated by sigma zero and sigma one. So if uh, B sub M is the prefix of the Pancio encoding of W of length M, then phi uh, so it sounds like i'm really distorted so what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, create another hotspot and see if i can improve my uh, connection just one moment so i'm i'm going to i'm going to pause this and then I will be back with you in a moment. My apologies for the sound, uh, the sound quality. It's one of those annoying internet things. Hmm. Well, uh, sorry, folks. Have we, uh, Is that any better? How's the sound quality? Yeah. I'm looking in the chat to see if the sound quality has improved. At the moment, it is fine, but who knows? It, it, yeah, it happens sorry, from sorry. time to time. Well, my apologies, and uh, what, what can you do? So here we go. So if uh, sigma is the anti-morphism on sigma two generated by sigma zero and sigma one, and uh, B sub M is the prefix of the Poncio encoding of length M, then UM looks like sigma uh, B sub M times phi um, U zero. So just to go back to the previous slide, all that I'm saying here, and I'm having some Difficulty going back to the previous slide. All I'm saying is that the multiplication, you have the Pancio, uh, you have the Pancio encoding reversed to, to do the multiplication. Now, a power x, y, x in W, a period x, y in length, uh, 
x, y, x corresponds to a power of pi of x, y, x in the Pansu encoding of period x, y, and length, the length of x, y, x minus n minus 1. So if the length of x is greater than or equal to n minus 1, then sigma of pi of x, y has to be the identity permutation because I've gotten back to x. So we call pi of x, y, x a kernel repetition in pi of w, since pi of x, y is in the kernel of the map phi. So Dijon's conjecture was solved by constructing binary sequences, avoiding short repetitions, that is to say repetitions where the length of x is less than n minus 1, and kernel repetitions. Now, I'm actually going to flip forward a little bit here and say, instead of doing the multiplication, which is rather annoying, so I was trying to do the, uh, the multiplication a few slides back, if we simply draw this Cayley graph from the permutation, the identity permutation, multiplying by sigma 1 gives me 0, 1, 2. Of course, sigma 1 is that three cycle 0, 1, 2. If I multiply by sigma 1 again, then the three cycle squared is 0, 2, 1. And if I multiply by sigma 1 again, the three cycle takes me back to the identity. So instead of trying to work on Instead of trying to do all of this multiplication using permutations, it's much more convenient to, to think about things on the Cayley graph. This is easier, I dare say, to program. If you think about it this way, it's certainly easier for hand calculations. So here we have um, the prefix of the Poncio encoding is 110. So Phi of u0 gets multiplied by sigma 1, sigma 1, 0. So 1, 1, 0, this gets reversed. So here I have 1, 1, 0 going backwards. This is why on the following slide, I talk about an anti-morphism. So that the image of xy is the image of y times the image of x, where we're swapping things around in the other order. Now, here, talking about powers x, y, x in the word w, so let's map back to our previous example here. So actually here. So here, when I have this power, or excuse me, when I have this factor in VTM, which is repeated, I have the same factor repeated in the Poncio encoding, but the word of length n minus one, which is zero, one here, after the, after the Poncio encoding works on 0, 1, first I have 0, 1, then I have 1, 2, then I have 2, 0, and so on. When I come here, I've gotten back to 0, 1 again, which means if I take the permutation corresponding to 0, 1, and I multiply it by the, the uh, permutation Sigma 1, sigma 1, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 1, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 1, sigma 0, sigma 1, it takes me back to 0, 1. So in other words, this piece of the Poncio encoding under the map phi goes to the identity permutation. So when I have a power in W, it gives me a power in the Poncio encoding. And if I have a power in the Pansio encoding corresponding to a power in W, this section xy, sigma of pi of xy has to be the identity permutation. Now there is a caveat because the way that I set up these permutations, these were set up for factors of length n minus 1. So I need x to be long enough to begin with a factor of length x minus 1. And then we have this idea of kernel repetitions and short repetitions. And so ever since uh, Poncio and uh, moulin Olanier, this is how we've been thinking about uh, Dijon's conjecture. Now, I've, I've kind of uh, let the cat out of the bag. So if, if a power x, y, x in W has period P length m minus 1, then the Poncio encoding has period P 
And that piece of the Poncio encoding has length m minus n minus one, because for the Poncio encoding, we always get the first n minus one letters given to us for free. And if x, if the length of x is greater than or equal to n minus one, then the piece of the Poncio encoding maps to the identity. And for fixed n, rather than working in sigma n and doing this arithmetic with permutations, it's easier to work on the Cayley graph. So here I started, I started with the, the identity permutation. I multiply by sigma one, I multiply again by sigma one, then I multiplied by sigma zero and I ended up with one, two. So the arithmetic for me is, is it's nicer to avoid it and just work on this graph. However, this graph is not particularly mysterious. If power x, y, uh, sorry. So the graph, this Cayley graph, is actually well known to us under an alias. It's just the De Bruyne graph of the link two factors of w. So this, you know, instead of writing down the permutation corresponding to 0, 1, the permutation corresponding to 1, 2, and so on, I can just walk along the De Bruyne graph. If I see a 1, then w contains 0, 1, 2. I see another one, so w contains 1, 2, 0, and the final length 2 factor is 2, 0. And then if I see a 0, then I have 2, 0, 2, which brings me to 0, 2. So although we have used group theory going from Poncio to Olenier, it would be more natural probably to use directed graphs in the combinatorics on word con context because we're all very familiar with uh, De Bruyne graphs. Just a thought. Now, you can verify that the Poncio encoding of an infinite threshold word cannot contain 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, 1. So for example, in, uh, when we think of the case of uh, ternary uh, square-free words, if I had a word starting with 0, 1, and then I had a Poncio encoding of 0, 0, I would have zero, one, go back to zero, and then one, zero, one. So I'd have zero, one, zero, one if I had this in the Poncio encoding. So a zero, zero cannot be a factor of the Poncio encoding of a threshold word, nor can I have one, 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 which means the Poncio encoding itself is made up of three pieces. It's made up of zero, one, zero, one, one, and zero, triple one. Now, uh, consider the alphabet sigma three again. I'm going to form a graph on the vertices of the previous graph. Uh, and for each alpha in uh, one, two, three, and for each vertex x, y of that De Bruyne graph, I introduce an edge from x, y to z, w, labeled by alpha, exactly when z, w is the endpoint of the walk in the previous graph labeled by f of alpha, starting at x, y. So a word u in s star labels a closed walk on g exactly when u labels a closed, f of u labels a closed walk in the previous graph. So let's roll back the De Bruyne graph here. So if I have a kernel repetition, if I have a piece of the Poncio encoding that maps to the identity, that means that when, if I start here, so if I look at one, zero, one, zero, I have that maps to the identity permutation. So closed walks on this graph uh, correspond to uh, pieces of the Poncio encoding which are in the kernel. Now the Poncio encoding parses into these blocks 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So if I look at a 0, 1, 1, 1, I would map from 0, 1 to 1, 0. So I want to, I want to take this um, De Bruyne graph and I'm going to change the edges. 
I'm going to have an edge labeled by three, which goes from zero, one to one, zero, because f of three is zero, one, one, one. So we get this graph. If I start at zero, one, there's an edge labeled by three that takes me to one, zero. So this graph up to isomorphism comes out of um, a 2010 paper of Schur, and I will talk about what he did with that. Um, 2A studied finite, right infinite, doubly infinite, and circular words avoiding powers. The last two types of words are more structurally uniform than the first two because there are no ends where a monkey business can happen. So for example, if we all know that if we have an overlap free word, it's more or less the image of something under the two way Morse uh, morphism. However, you can fiddle with the initial few letters of, of an overlap free word. If you have a circular word or you have a doubly infinite word, there are no initial few letters for you to fiddle with. So that when, when you look at circular overlap free binary words, they're extremely regular and uh, two way characterized what they all look like. Now a lot of word has, work has been done on linear words avoiding patterns, but there's all kinds of questions, existence questions regarding circular words avoiding patterns. Uh, once an infinite word avoiding some pattern exists, a finite linear words of every length obviously exist. You just take a factor of the appropriate length. But the situation is different for circular words. For example, you can work out on the back of an envelope, there is no circular binary overlap free word of length five. Uh, the following conjecture seems to be due to Jamie Simpson. Uh, Jamie conjectured there are circular ternary square free words of length n exactly for the lengths other than 5, 7, 9, 10, 14, and 17. So this was drawn to my attention. The problem was solved in 2002 using a very typical approach for us now. So you, you show that, well, these words exist if n is greater than or equal to 180, and then you give it to your computer and your computer kicks out words uh, for the appropriate values up to 180. Now this reminds me of a, a wonderful question which uh, Jean Berstel asked uh, Narad Rampersad at the uh, Turku Words Conference in, I think it must have been something like 2004. Narad gave this great proof. It had a morphism of length 800. Jean Berstel puts up his hand and says, uh, so why would we believe that's true? You know, it, and, and of course, when we, when we analyze things by computer, uh, it's not necessarily convincing, although de depending on who's doing the com computations, I, I choose to, to believe the computations or not. In, in any case, in 2010, Schur gave a computer free proof of this result, and he used a variation of Poncio encodings. Uh, given a word W looking like 0, 1, 0, 2 up to 0, M, excuse me, U1, U2 up to UM, where the UI are letters, um, a circular word is the set of the conjugates of W. So it's natural to think of W as consisting of the letters of W arranged in a circle or a necklace. So equivalently, we can consider the indices of the letters of a circular word um, to belong to Zn, the integers modulo n, so that un plus one is just u1. So here is a circular word, and with this circular, this is a circular ternary square free word, and I want to look at a pancio encoding for this word. So consider the letters zero and two marked in blue here. Those two letters are different, so I mark that with a one. Now I shift over and I look at the letters one and zero. Those two letters are different, so they're marked with a one. Shift again, two and two, those are the same, so that's marked with a zero, and so on. Zero and one are different, so that's marked with a one. Two and zero are different, so that's marked with a one. 
one and zero are the same, so that's marked with a zero. So now I have a circular Poncio encoding for this word. So the Poncio encoding of 202101 is 01011011. Now this may be a little bit confusing here. Uh, 202101, 202101. I've been calling this 012021. It comes from the beginning of uh, VTM. However, I'd like to parse things into the blocks 011. 0, 1, 1. These are the blocks uh, F, which I introduced earlier. So for that purpose, it's convenient to start my circular word at 2. So the Poncio encoding of 202101 is 011011, which is F of 2, 2. F just counts once, right? 2, 2. In the circular word, um, U0, U1, which is 2, 0, that's the same as if I come out to the sixth position, the sixth digit of this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And here's the seventh. So zero, U0, zero, U1 is, is 0, 1. That's the same as U6, U7, which means that sigma of 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 has to be the identity. If you have a circular word, you have to go around and come back where you started. Right? So sigma of 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 has to be the identity permutation. Or to put it another way, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 gives a closed walk on the De Bruyne graph. And 2, 2 labels a closed walk on the graph G. Just to remind you, The graph G, this is um, sort of a De Bruyne graph, except now the edges indicate how F moves you between the two letter factors. Now, the nice thing about parsing Poncio encodings by F is you're only dealing with words which are roughly one third as long. Instead of dealing with 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, I'm dealing with 2, 2. And here is a theorem uh, from Schur's paper. If W labels a closed walk on the graph G, then F of W is the Poncio encoding of a square free circular word if a W has no factor 1, 1, triple two, 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 three, three, two, two, or three, three, three. It has no factor uh, zero x, y, z, excuse me, u, x, y, u, with u, x, y, a closed walk. In other words, there's no power. This, this is like a square in the Poncio encoding. A square would be, a, would, would be u, x, y, u, x, y, but we leave two letters off because it's only a Poncio encoding. Now this is not quite an if and only if. So for example, U0102 has this Poncio encoding 1, 1. So although 0102 gives you a circular uh, square free word, when you look at the Poncio encoding, it contains a 1, 1. So you, you need a few more conditions which are somewhat ugly to turn this into an if and only if. But you could, I think you could probably intuitively understand why uh, Schur is able to avoid uh, computers in his proof. Essentially, he's working with words which are only one third as long. So the sorts of uh, searches you have to do in the tree, you only go to one third the depth and, you, and everything is, is simpler. And you also get some additional structural insights. So here's a variation on Poncio encodings. Poncio encodings were induced, they were introduced for threshold problems, but they have a natural application to, they have a natural application to circular words. 
and uh, here is here is here are some applications. So call the word W level if the amount of each letter is as close as possible. So if if I have a word W and I count the I count letter I and I count letter J, then the difference between the number of I's and the number of J's is zero plus or minus one. So the number of occurrences of each digit is roughly the same. And uh, call a, a binary word, an FS word, stands for Frankel Simpson, who, who created the first such uh, construction, I think. Uh, if the only square factors of W are 0, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 1, 0, 1. So uh, Jesse Johnson used uh, Schur's approach, extra word, my apologies. Jesse Johnson used Schur's approach uh, to prove the following results in his master's thesis. So he proved there are level ternary circular square free words of length n. Uh, for every n except n equals 5, 7, 9, 10, 14, and 17. And he proved there are circular, uh, we call them Frankel Simpson words. I, my apologies to all of you who have proved, uh, <laughs> there are several people who've given nice constructions and uh, actually Jeffrey Shalad and his uh, student, the name of your student, Jeff, uh, recently put something on the archive where they looked at the simplest constructions. Anyway, perhaps for the questions. So there are these circular FS words for, of every length. And uh, the, the reason, who cares about these level words? Well, there are a couple of cases in which we care about the length of constructed words. So for example, if someone says, how many, how many words are there of length M which avoid a billion cubes on a certain alphabet. Well, then you come up with some construction to show, oh, this grows exponentially, here's, here's a word, and I know what the length of the word is. So with circular words, um, the theorem which we saw a couple of slides ago, there are circular words exactly of these lengths. Well, there's a whole bunch of questions of that type. Uh, for what lengths are there circular words avoiding a billion fourth powers? for example. For what lengths are there ternary uh, words, circular ternary words avoiding abelian cubes and so forth, right? So you can easily formulate all sorts of questions about characterizing link lengths for circular words. And lengths also come up if you're trying to talk about uh, the number of words avoiding a pattern of a certain length. Anyhow, if, if a word is level, if a word is level, then when you take the image of it under a morphism G, you know what the length is. You just take the total length of G, so you add up the image of the first letter under G, the second letter under G, the, you add up the lengths of all the images, that's the length of G, and just multiply it by K. If I have a word on an N letter alphabet of length K times N, it contains exactly K of each of the N letters. And so the length of G of W is K times the length of G. So level words, this is the same kind of thing that you use uh, K uniform morphisms for. Um, so when it was shown that the number of, when it was shown that the number of ternary square free words grows exponentially with length, that used uniform morphisms, right? So of course, when I take the image of a word U under a, under a uniform morphism, then the length of the image is k times the length of u. So that's that's why that's why level words were were you know we thought they were interesting. Okay, let's talk about undirected k powers. Um, this is work with uh, Lucas Mole. Uh, call x y z an undirected k power if z is either x or the reverse of x. And the length of xyx divided by the length of xy is equal to k. So re-enter is an undirected 7 fifths power. It has length 7 and re and er, well, one is the reverse of the other. Similarly, stalest, length 7, st is the same as st. 
So just to comment, if we instead required that Z was an anagram of X, we would have an abelian power in, uh, in the sense that uh, Kassane and, and I introduced in 1999. And of course, if, if we simply said Z had to be equal to X, we would have ordinary powers. You can also see undirected powers as a common generalization of gapped repeats and gapped palindromes. So the undirected repetition, repetition threshold function is defined to be the infimum of R such that undirected R powers are avoidable on K letters. So they say that consistency is the bugbear of little minds. So the original re repetitive threshold function I gave as a supremum, this one I'm giving as an infimum. And here's a theorem uh, with Lucas Mole. For k equals four, five, up to 21, we have the, the undirected repetition threshold is k minus one over k minus two. So uh, there's an obvious conjecture that this is the correct expression for all k. So avoiding gap palindromes x, y, x reverse, where the length of x is greater than one, is actually rather easy. So for example, if I take one, two, three, repeated infinitely, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, it doesn't have any gap palindromes like this. If you look at any two letter word like one, two, the reverse never occurs. So we'll actually focus on the issue of constructing words, avoiding just the K minus one over K minus two plus powers. So let's go back to Dijon's conjecture. I, I sort of zipped over part of this rather quickly. Suppose W is a word on the K letter alphabet, infinite word on the K letter alphabet that avoids R plus powers for some fixed R. So consider the case in Dijon's conjecture where R is K divided by K minus one. If I want to avoid powers greater than R, factors of length K minus one must contain K minus one distinct letters. Otherwise, there will be a word of, of length at most k minus one, which begins and ends with the same letter. And this will give us a, an exponent of at least k minus one over k minus two, which is greater than k, minus, k over k minus one. So factors of length k minus one have to have k minus one distinct letters. So suppose this is a prefix of a Dijon threshold word, W, the AIR letters. So this segment from A2 up to AK has length K minus one. So the letters A2, A3 up to AK must be distinct. So that means AK is one of the letters in sigma K minus A2 up to AK minus one. Now there are only two letters in here. Right, I've taken out k minus two letters from sigma k. So of these two letters, the one occurring closest to the end of this prefix is a1. Right, a1 is not equal to a2, a3, up to a k minus one, because that's a factor of length k minus one. It has to have distinct letters. So the Poncio encoding, another way to talk about the Poncio encoding well, we could scan prefixes of W, starting with the length K prefix. And when I scan that prefix, I stick a zero on the end of the Poncio encoding. If AK is equal to the letter of sigma K minus A2 up to AK minus one, closest to the end of the prefix. Uh, and we stick a one on if AK is the letter of AK minus A2 up to AK minus one, second closest to the end. So now consider the case where R is K minus one over K minus two, as in the undirected powers problem. In this case, uh, factors of W of length K minus two must contain K minus two distinct letters. Otherwise W contains a power of exponent at least k minus two over k minus three, which is too big. Now, suppose I have a prefix p a1, a2 up to a k minus one, where the ai are letters. So these letters have to be distinct. 
the letters a2 up to ak minus 1 have to be distinct, which means that ak minus 1 is one of the three letters in sigma k minus this. And of those three letters, the one closest to the end is a1, because these letters, a1 up to ak minus 2, have to be distinct. So we can have a Ponciot-like encoding, B. You scan the prefixes of length uh, k minus 1. Sorry, we scan the prefixes, starting with the length k minus 1 prefix. And when we've scanned a prefix, we stick a 0 on if a k minus 1 is the letter of sigma k minus a2 up to a k minus 2 closest to the end. We stick on a 1 if a k is the letter second closest to the end. And we affix 2 if a k is the letter of sigma k minus a2, a3 up to a k minus 2, third closest to the end. So it's like a Poncio encoding, except that we're over a three letter alphabet. Um, there are some technical issues when you start with the prefix of length k minus 1 because there hasn't been a second closest and a third closest letter. So either you introduce some tie-breaking convention or you change the encoding. You start with the first prefix of w containing all the letters of the alphabet. So you get this Poncio-like encoding b. And when I look at this prefix, instead of thinking only about the... Uh, only about this uh, suffix of length k minus 1. Let's encode the whole prefix. The prefix, I will take a1, a2 up to a, excuse me, this should be k minus 2. I uh, somehow switched, switched there, up to a k minus 2. And this is the, so this is the letter closest to the end. Then r2 should be the letter second closest to the end of p. And R3 should be the letter third closest to the end. So once again, we can have a correspondence now between prefixes and uh, permutations. So let ui be the prefix of w of length i plus k minus 1. We have a similar relation to what we had in the Poncio encoding, but with different permutations. And I will say, Lucas and I simply worked with uh, the arithmetic on permutations. Um, hadn't been thinking about the De Bruyne graphs yet. So if sigma is the antimorphism generated by sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, if B sub M is the prefix of the encoding of length M, then phi of UM is sigma of B sub M times phi of U sub 0. And you end up also, again, in the same way, you have to avoid some short repetitions and some kernel repetitions. It's exactly analogous to Dijon's conjecture, but over a three-letter alphabet. And, and what happened here is you went from k over k minus 1 to k minus 1 over k minus 2, and, and that controls the longest the longest factors that you can guarantee have distinct letters. So here's a second variation on Poncio encodings. So I would say we're starting to, we're starting to see more possibilities for Poncio encodings. The constructions in the solutions, oh, and now here's a couple of slides. Poncio encodings are unnecessary. You don't need them. The constructions in the solutions to Dijon's conjecture use binary fixed points of doles, these are Poncio encodings. They're decoded into words over the alphabet sigma n. So from a formal point of view, the words witnessing the correctness of Dijon's conjecture are transductions of Doyle sequences. But there's a theorem of decking, and you can look it up in uh, Aleutian Shalit's book on automatic sequences. The transduction of an h dual sequence is an h dual sequence. So witnesses to the Dijon's conjecture can be given directly by h duals over horrendous alphabets. Um, so some points in favor of Poncio encodings. When you attack threshold problems via encodings, you, you unify the thing and you're only working over a, small, a certain fixed alphabet instead of using multiple alphabets. In uh, Carpi's contribution, the major contribution to solving Dijon's conjecture, he used group theory in an important way, that, which sort of implies the group viewpoint is necessary. And in the case of square-free words, uh, these encodings, 
and the parsing function f reduce the depth of searches by a third. So here are some open problems. Uh, so a student might like to look at Carpi's group theoretic work. So Carpi's paper where he proves Dijon's conjecture for all n greater than or equal to 33. He does some group theoretic stuff. Maybe it would be good to look at that in terms of De Bruyne graphs. Does it give us more insight into what's going on? Uh, if you want to solve your own uh, threshold problem, you can prove that the undirected repetitive threshold is k minus 1 over k minus 2 for all k greater than or equal to 4. And just generally speaking, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done characterizing the lengths of circular words which avoid various things. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, James. Uh, does anyone have any questions for James?